excited because right over here in the back, we have Scott Hunter and Mike Harsh with Beth Massey. I want you to grill them all about .NET. Let's go to that right now. Hey guys, this is Beth, and I am the uh, product marketing manager for .NET, and I'm here with Mike and Scott. You guys want to introduce yourselves? Sure. I'm Mike Harsh. I'm a GPM on the Windows Platform team. Uh, Scott Hunter, the director of PM uh, on the .NET team. All right, so uh, we had some amazing .NET announcements today, didn't we? Indeed. Okay, so I think the number one on Hacker News all day has been the open sourcing of WPF WinForms and WinUI XAML library. Yeah. What, what is, the heck what is, is that? that thing? Okay, so yes, it's been trending <laughs> on uh, the number one spot on Hacker News all day, which has been awesome. That's been um, fantastic. The, the, there's, I think there's like 225 comments already, so it's been yeah. awesome to see. Um, so there's been some comments on Twitter too. Uh, so folks have talked about what is the story with UWP, why is that not being open source? So there's a little bit of um, naming confusion, and so I just want to straighten that out a little bit. So Windows UI XAML is the official name of what we're calling the UI stack that's in UWP. So the UI that you know is in built into Windows for the UWP um, program model, we're calling Windows uh, UI XAML. Um, that name is actually reused. That is the the name of the NuGet control package that we um, we released to build, um, and that is what was the first part of Windows UI XAML that was open source today. Um, that will be the project on GitHub that we uh, eventually put all of the Windows UI controls and the rest of the Windows UI XAML framework into. Um, and so timing-wise, that will you know, kind of happen throughout uh, 2019. Okay, gotcha. So, so not everything is open right away, but we're, yeah. as we make more code yeah. available in the coming is, months. Is it primarily, thing? The, primarily okay. the controls? Today, what's, what's available is a set of the controls. Um, and the things that are in the, the Windows uh, UI library, you get packaged today, those are all open source. And then um, we're going to be rapidly adding more controls to that, and then um, a little more slowly, but still, um, hopefully in the next year, get all of the rest of the framework. So, so the app layout layer itself will actually be there as well. Yeah, and the you know the, okay. the layout engines, all of the data binding, all of the things that make a UI framework a UI framework, okay. not just controls. Awesome, and I know this is like one one really big ask from the community, so it's really nice to see this happen today. So really exciting. Um, do we have we already have pull requests and everything actually? So there's been some <laughs> there's been some really uh, really interesting discussion. I've been paying a lot of attention to the WinForms um, repo. So I I'm kind of I should admit I. I started my first job at Microsoft in 2000 was as a PM on the WinForms team. So I worked there for about six years. Um, so I have a lot of uh, um, a lot of passion for the WinForms yeah. space. And so I've been close really paying attention, yeah. very close, um, <laughs> to, that, to that repo today. And there was, um, I think, two really interesting discussions. I mean, Oren had the first pull request that Scott did on stage. That was really cool to see. Um, one kind of spontaneous thing that happened in the community today was uh, some of the icons, so the WinForms had to work all the way down to Windows 98, and Windows 98 didn't have a built-in hand icon. Okay. And so there was a hard-coded resource, and um, that meant that you always got the hard-coded resources, and if they changed the system, you didn't get the new ones. And so um, the, there was a, a pull request to say, why don't we update this and, and not use the hard-coded one anymore because, um, you know, .NET Core 3 works down to Windows 7. Obviously, Windows 98 hasn't been supported for a minute. <laughs> and so that that was a pretty cool thing to see. And then cool. there's this other thing called the task dialog, which is a, a, it's a Windows feature. It's like a super message box. And there was basically a discussion around um, adding a new class for that to both WinForms and WPF. So you can get kind of a super message box. So it's, it's already like the community is kicking in. Good things are happening. That's so awesome. Well, neat. OK, so let's talk a little bit about .NET Core 3. Um, and it's supporting WPF and WinForms. It's pretty cool too, right? Yes. Why, what's the big benefit of that, of that Scott? What, what do we get? <clears throat> When .NET Core was created, the, the, it was meant to solve some of the problems we learned over the years building .NET Framework. The primary one being, <clears throat> sorry for my, my voice. I know you're sick as a dog. Um, the primary one being, how many .NET Frameworks can you have on a machine? So, you know, we, we technically support two today, .NET Core 2, I mean .NET Framework 2 and .NET 4X. 3.5 is actually a variant of two, so there's always been right. only two versions on, on a Windows machine at a, at a time. So. One of the benefits you get with core is obviously you can have as many cores side by side by side as you want. Um, no longer do you have to worry about risking an application breaking because the framework changes. I see. And you know, we don't try to break anybody's applications, but the reality is fixing a bug, you, maybe you depend on a bug and you don't know you depend on a bug. That happens. I mean, stuff just happens. Um, we want to give customers more control. Um, another cool thing you get with .NET Core is um, you don't even have to depend on a framework being on the machine. Uh, you'll be able to actually take your WinForm WPF application, compile it down to a single exe that is self-contained. It contains the framework, your application, all of those things. Um, and I think what it really means is, as a developer, you can decide to be on the latest version of a framework 
and not worry about IT having to go and update all the boxes. So it's like X copy deploy for WinForms. It is. It's awesome. Um, and WPF. And WPF, right. And then there's one final other, you know, big advantage, I think, and that is um, core um, is where we will try new APIs. Um, and so the latest, greatest APIs are in core today. Um, some of the new C-sharp features will only be in core. So if you, want to, if you want to be on the bleeding edge of APIs, the bleeding edge of language features, core is the place to be. That said, Dynamic Framework's not going away. It will never go away. I, I said so this is my talk today. I'm like, it's part of Windows. We have a lot of applications at Microsoft that rely I've, on I've products. This, I have this app on my laptop it. called Visual Studio. Visual Studio, it's built exactly. built on .NET Framework. Who's right? ever heard of that though, Scott? Right. Who uses um, that? So it's, it's yeah. But it's really support, it, it, will, it will be supported as long as Windows is supported. Okay, so the idea is that uh, .NET Framework itself is going to be safe and reliable and always supported on Windows, yes. okay? And that .NET Core will have more of the bleeding edge features. If you want to take something, you can. You can deploy it with the app so you don't risk breaking other applications. And so that's why we can move faster with .NET Core. Right. Is that what you're saying? And you can be okay. on, there's, there's two .NET Core trains. There's the LTS train, which is the long-term supported train. Um, which about one of those comes out a year. Okay. And there's the, I want the every other month bits. Got it. Uh, faster track. So you can choose which track of core you want. One app what can LTS be on. What LTS are we on like now? 2.1? 2.1. 2.1, uh, okay. So and so the next LTS, LTS uh, will be 3.1. Okay, gotcha. So we'll ship a 3.0 sometime in the July, August time frame, I would hope, of, of 2019. And that means that the LTS build would show up somewhere in the October, November time frame if we hit those dates. So what about on the server side? I mean, we've got to have, to have some improvements in .NET Core 3 for ASP.NET developers too, right? That's the biggest misconception I think that people had. We, we were so heavily focused on talking about desktop at build this year. Yeah. Uh, we were so excited about bringing WinForms and WPF to Core uh, that we didn't talk a lot about the, the server. The server is just as exciting as, as to me as the, as the client side. Uh, one of the coolest features we're going to have is something that we've been, it was called, it was codenamed Blazor. Okay, right. um, and this was letting you actually write C-sharp code in the in the in the browser, and this is not like fake C sharp code. This was actually the assemblies download and run in a, in a sandbox. This is the WebAssembly in the browser using WebAssembly. Yeah. Okay, um, and we've been showing that for the last year or so. Um, the first flavor of that will ship as part of Core three as well. It'll be part of ASP.NET Core three. Um, your code will actually run on the server, but the programming model is still the programming model where it appears that you're C -sharp, you're writing C sharp in the browser. I see inside of the HTML inside of inside of that. So you write, they're called Razor Components, right? Razor so you components. Create, create UI, yes. it all in C-sharp, and so you have a full stack web development with C-sharp. You don't stack. have to like write JavaScript at all. You don't have to rely on Angular, React, uh, Vue. You can, don't have to write JavaScript. I mean, we're not trying to, this is not a war against JavaScript. No, this I is, just, it's, I love C-sharp. Use the skills so. that you have. If, you're, yeah. if you have a lot of C-sharp mm -hmm. skills and you want to use those mm -hmm. in the browser, Bang, you can now use those in the browser. It's, you know, a context switching sometimes too, you know. I mean, I think that's why the, the appeal of Node, you know, Node.js, because you're just using JavaScript on both sides, right? So right. these C-sharp developers can enjoy that as well. I think that's fantastic. Actually, there's a question here that kind of relates to ASP.NET. Uh, are there any modification requirements to move ASP.NET MVC Core 2 project to Core 3? Can it be done now? So the best way to answer that question would be we just shipped uh, ASP.NET Core 2.2 today as well. So not only do we have the 3.0 announcement, right. uh, we just had the 2.2 announcement. What I would tell the customer is they should move to 2.2. Two first. Okay. Um, all we did for 3.0, the 3.0 build that came out today basically has the exact same ASP.NET Core 2.2 bits I see. that shipped as part of 2.2. Okay. So there's no benefit to move to 3 yet. Won't be till later this not later this year. Sometime next year. <laughs> um, wow, preview one <laughs> comes out quick. Yeah, sometime sometime, sometime like, next year, okay, gotcha. we'll start having the next innovations beyond the 2.2 stuff. They'll start showing up in the 3.0 bits. But today, okay. your best bet is to stay on 2.2. But we aren't anticipating any major like changes that you would have to make. Our, to our move. goal is to make it as okay. easy as possible to cool. move. I mean, there will always be some breaking changes. 2.0 to 3.0 is, there's some breaking changes. We assemble the product differently than we did before. I mean, if you're an ASP.NET customer, um, the ASP.NET frameworks have traditionally come as NuGet packages. Um, okay. And so there was .NET Core, and then there was ASP.NET Core, which is kind of separate. Okay. Um, now we're shipping the whole thing as a monolith mm -hmm. again. Um, and uh, that's, that's to enable a bunch of cool scenarios. We have partners like Red Hat that have a version of .NET Core they ship. We want ASP.NET Core to be in part of that. So it all has to be built from gotcha. source. Okay. So, uh, cool. So how will we acquire, like, is, is the 
wind forms and WPF. Is that going to also be like NuGet packages, or how is that going to work? It's, it's, it's you just you just go download the three O SDK and, it'll and be in type there. .NET new wind Perfect. forms, and you're you're good to go. Good, great. So you're going to show a little demo of I, this. I can actually. do a little demo. I'm kind you're of be intrigued. Porting a WinForms app here. I'm so you're going to take a WinForms app on Framework and you're going to port it to Core. Yeah. So I've got a. Uh, and first off, I need to also preface. Preview one is pretty rough. Okay. We, we knew it was going to be pretty rough. We, <laughs> okay. we we primarily focused on the actual runtime. So most of the work has been done in the Core three runtime. The tooling is a little bit behind us. Okay. Meaning that File New in VS 2019 does not have WinForm for Core or WPF for Core. We'll have more previews. It will get we will better. have more previews. Okay. We don't have we don't have visual designers okay. um, yet, but I'm going to show you how you can actually build a core project and actually use the designers from the full framework application. So if you look at my laptop, I've got Visual Studio 2019 here, which is required for core apps, core three apps. And if I run it, this is a memory matching game. You know, you have, you keep clicking these things until you find the the ones that match, and you click through. And and so we thought, hey, let's let's port this to core. Um, so it's going to be a little crazy. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go here and my command prompt, and I'll do .NET new WinForms, and I'll say output. We'll do matching game core. So that basically builds me a skeleton of a WinForm application on core. So let's go back to our solution, and we'll go add that existing project. So now we have a core WinForm app in here. And uh, I said it in my startup project. It runs and builds. Hello.NET Core. Woo awesome. Um, but really what I want to do is I want to get that, that game running over here. So I'm going to cheat a little bit. <laughs> OK. So one of the features we've had in Core for a long time is our project system is pretty cool. That if you look on the screen here, I've got the forms, the program CS, and whatnot. If I look at my project file, they're not in the project file. Just points to the folder. It points at the folder, and we glob in all the C sharp files. I can also have it glob in from somewhere else. So oh. what I'm going to do is I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to go take all the all the all the code. Let's just erase it. And then let's go back and open that that CS project again. And I've just for you know, screw this up on stage. <laughs> just paste some code over here. And what I'm going to basically do is paste in a item group that tells the system to basically include files from a particular folder. So in our case, we'll just erase this. There you go. So as I save that, notice that all the files from the full framework app just showed up in the core app. Cool. That's pretty cool. So I'm cheating. I'm aliasing into the existing project. I see. So. Any code changes I make to these files happen in both the full framework and the core application. Scott, good engineers don't cheat, they're efficient. So <laughs> now the next thing is if I build this, I'm going to see a couple of errors. So let's do a build. And first off, as I get a, a duplicate type uh, assembly uh, company attribute attribute. And that's because um, in a .NET framework application, we typically have a properties app with an assembly info. Okay. In core, we said, why have a file that was basically a place to put metadata? We said in Core, let's put the metadata in the project file. Um, and so what's happening is, um, in this particular case, I'm trying, uh, .NET Core is trying to dynamically gener generate one from the project file. And so there's two of these things. Conflicting. Conflicting. Yeah. And they're conflicting. So we'll tell it to uh, generate assembly info false. Better. Um, now, my, my matching game uses this game logic, and I need to reference that as well. So I'll just come over here, we'll add a reference. So you're basically switching project systems, and so you're kind of doing some manual changes around yeah. the project system itself, but a, not the source code. Exactly. Yeah. So the source code's all the same. Now that reference is there, and now I've got the exact same app running on core. Um, cool. And, and it works just the same as it did before. 
Okay, so that's a little manual because we don't have all of the tooling yet, but you, you, as you can see, guys, you can take some of your apps that you have today and you can see if they're running on core and how and, they perform and that kind of yep, thing. And like the repos have instructions on how to do this cool. for both WinForms and WPF. Great. And also, if you hit more than just um, project system issues, um, you, can, uh, you can use the API port tool to find out which APIs right. aren't, that, supported. Uh, aren't, need, aren't supported um, currently. And um, you know the, the set of APIs that's going to be in three isn't fully baked yet too. Right. So um, if you uh, open an issue with the API, um, we can we can take a look at that and bring that back. If you look at my my uh, gaming logic uh, DLL or assembly, if you look, I actually had a porting problem, and because I had a porting problem, you can see that I installed the Microsoft Windows compatibility pack. Ah. That's a NuGet package. So .NET Core. Mm -hmm. By itself, it was designed to be cross-platform, which means we can't ever put uh, Windows-specific things into .NET Core. Yep. So we have a NuGet package we, we put out a while ago um, in the, in the 2.2, or actually the 2.1 time frame, I think. Um, and what it does is it basically brings a lot of Windows things back. It brings uh, registry back, uh, it brings directory services back, system management back. Uh, and so if you try to port some of your code and you find APIs missing, the first thing to look at is go and grab this NuGet package, stick it in. In my case, the uh, game actually saved your high score in the registry. I see. So you and so I brought this API. in to use the registry. Okay, got it. All right, so that's good. That's cool. Um, so there's another interesting announcement and feature about .NET Core 3 that I wanted to ask you about. These things called XAML Islands. Yes. Yeah. XAML Islands. So, so XAML Islands is a Windows feature okay. that uh, sh first shipped um, in the release that I think it's just starting to roll out now. Um, internally, we called it Redstone 5. Um, I forget what the actual official name <laughs> okay. is because the, the marketing team picks forgettable <laughs> names on purpose. It's just Windows 10. Um, and there will be some, some additional improvements on that feature that are, are coming out uh, in spring release okay. uh, for Windows. But basically, the idea is you can take a, uh, a piece of uh, Windows UI XAML, a control, and you can embed it in a WinForms or WPF app or anything with really an HWIND. It's effectively an H1 host. Okay. Um, and then you can start to use new UI features. That's what Scott Hanselman showed on stage today with the signature control. That's the, mm -hmm. the ink canvas and the ink toolbar from, uh, from the Windows uh, UI XAML library and just plop that into an existing app. So that's, that's what that feature is all about. And that works in both .NET Core 3 apps as well as .NET Framework apps. Cool. So basically, you're saying I could take my app and slowly take a mm -hmm. you know, onesie, twosie approach yes. to moving it to Windows 10. Yes. Okay. I mean, the, the, you know, our goal here is to really bring all these platforms together. So um, you know, you can use any feature in any app type, regardless of where you started from. You, know, okay. you, you shouldn't think of them as different platforms. It's just one set of APIs you can choose from based on what you want to do. So I can get a modern browser in my WinForms app now. That's right. OK. That's very similar to that concept. It's very similar to what we did in ASP.NET years ago. We called it one ASP.NET, which was, hey, you might start with a web form application, but you want to add MVC, or you want to add SignalR. Well, now we don't care if you start with a WinForm app, a WPF application, you want to go ahead and add a, a XAML UI control, boom, just do that, right? Yep. Just choose the UI tech that you're comfortable with. That's fantastic. Yeah. And get all the features. Or, or have a giant code base in it. You don't, obviously don't want to either start from scratch or rewrite Correct. large things if you don't want if you I don't think have WinForms to. is like 2002, right? I mean, it's, it started from the beginning. Um, and then WPF was yeah. like 2007, 8. So these, these pro apps are probably about that old. They've got some, some good vintage <laughs> to them. Yeah, but they're probably business critical. Mm -hmm. And you know, are. they have to be modified and they have to be updated. But um, there's still a lot of people you know, actively doing WinForms and WPF development. There's you know, over 1 million monthly active WinForms developers. Yeah. I think it's 2 million. So. I think it's more than that. But so, so do we get like performance benefits as well as, as part of being on the core runtime? So you, you will get some performance benefits, um, primarily in, in the standpoint that we've, uh, you know, obviously ASP.NET Core, .NET Core has been, performance has been a big push with us. You've seen us take the web stack and be in the tech and power benchmarks. Um, and as a result of that, there's been features added to the language span. Mm -hmm. uh, there's been modifications to some of the BCL uh, to make some of those results happen. You might ask, well, why did you make those same changes into um, .NET Framework? Well, the reality is like we, we changed some of the file APIs to fix bugs that were in .NET Framework, but I can never put it in .NET Framework because it would break stuff. I see. Um, and so there are API improvements. Uh, yeah. Also, .NET Core is open source, so anybody can contribute. And so maybe something is too small that we would not look at, but somebody makes a performance fix from the community and we accept it. So you will find that uh, you know, Core is going to be a little faster than .NET Framework. 
Yes, so um, kind of a discussion going on on Twitch right now, what we should kind of address maybe. Um, so how does UWP fit into kind of all of this? You kind of started to say like before what the XAML, the mm -hmm. XAML library is. Mm -hmm. um, what is, how does this whole thing kind of fit together with UWP? So you should really think about um, basically if you have a WinForms UWP application um, and you're happy with that and you want to add some um, you know, new Windows 10 features to a desktop app and you have an existing desktop app, you can start adding those features. I mean, there's many of the WinRT APIs you could, you could use already. With XAML okay. Islands, we kind of closed most of the gaps of things that you can't use in an existing application. If you want to build an application that um, you know, is fully top to bottom brand new and modern, you can, you can start with UWP application. Um, there are, there's a lot of investment we're doing in the, in the UI stack there to, to kind of address some of the gaps that um, you know, customers have told us about for building line of business applications, you know, like shore up the, some of the data story and form okay. validation um, that we're actively working on. Uh, but the, the real reason that you would pick um, a UWP to start with, um, especially if you don't, if you're building a new application, is you can target other Microsoft devices. So if you want to go build an app on Xbox or Surface Hub, that's your that's your route for that. Got it. Okay. So XAML islands are really re desktop related only. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, that's very cool. Cool. All right. So, uh, <coughs> want to talk about a couple more announcements, Scott? I want to show one more demo real quick. Oh. Give me one second. Wow. Two demos from Mr. Hunter. Well, we showed um, before. We showed making that that uh, game. Yeah. Using WinForms. Uh oh. This is this going to be in a browser? Let me shrink this so it fits in the screen for everybody. We also took that same game. It just happened to be that that game was written in a great way where all the logic of the app was written inside of that uh, game logic assembly uh, or class library. Um, so it was very easy to go take the same UI and build it in the web. And so I shared that, that same project. It's a .NET Standard 2 uh, class library. I shared it across a Blazor app. And here I have the same game running in the browser. Oh, that's so hot. That's cool. That's so hot. So, wow. Yeah, thought I thought I would just show that. That is, that is the the goal is, you know, whatever UI you want to build, whether it's desktop UI or web UI, um, you know, Core is going to be a great place to be for that. That's cool. And we keep innovating and innovating and bringing in more um, workloads there. Like we have ML.NET as well for machine learning and AI. That's We've been doing a lot of work in, for like IoT. Work Azure IoT, IoT runs on some yeah. some .NET Core stuff, and so. Uh, uh, in the blog post on .NET Core 3 today, we talked about getting serial port access uh, in IoT for Linux. Um, We're going to do some fun IoT stuff today, too. So there's too. crazy stuff all across .NET. That's very cool. Um, so actually, let's ask, uh, here's a question from No Content, a really cute handle. I like that. Uh, will .NET Native also become for WPF and WinForms now since it's on .NET Core? So you want to... Talk a little bit about what .NET Native actually even is there, sure. Mike. Yeah, so .NET Native is the ahead of time compilation story that um, UWP apps uh, use today. And so um, if you're super familiar with it from developing, you, there's definitely some quirks around it um, because it, it, it basically looks over all your code and basically um, ahead of time compiles it to uh, x86 or, um, or ARM. You're, there's some, some features in .NET um, like reflection if you don't have um, a type there that that's already been generated, you basically will you know kind of get a missing method exception. There's some some bad things can happen there. Um, on the flip side, you do get a bunch of great performance out of it. So it, it is a, a very um, interesting story. Um, but I believe that Scott can talk about the the AOT story for .NET Core is going to go in a slightly different direction. I believe. Yeah, we haven't really announced that direction, but I, I will I will talk about what you said, which is which is a great point. As we started building the WebAssembly work, that's the Blazor stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you need an AOT solution, and like, do we use .NET Native or do we use something else? Currently, the Blazor work uses Mono, actually. Okay. Um, because they that that runtime had more support for WebAssembly type types of things. The one thing we want to be very good at, we want to be very clear about is when we do a, a, a new native impl implementation, we'll do it where .NET can be .NET all the time. Like Mike said, um, .NET Native made some sacrifices for security and performance um, by removing parts of .NET. Whatever we do in the future, we'll give you an AOT ahead of time compile that actually runs all of your .NET code. So it might mean that we have to use an interpreter along with some of the native code. I see. Uh, but I want to make sure that whatever .NET we give you is the full .NET. And then if you want to go dial some of it down, if you want to go turn reflection off for security reasons uh, or size of device or whatever, you can do that. But because you made the decision to do that, you understand that uh, 
it's you know, there's less compatibility there than there was before. No surprises, um, basically. But I don't think uh, the AOT wave will be after the .NET Core 3 wave. Okay. So we'll ship .NET Core 3 with Blazor uh, running on the server side, um, and hopefully we'll start previewing some of the AOT stuff after that. Um, cool. But, yeah. and, and I think to close the, the, the question a little bit for, for no content there, um, <laughs> basically, we want to make sure that the, the AOT story um, that we developed for Core also applies to UAP. So you have, again, one can, you know, all this is about having a consistent .NET story everywhere, and we want to make sure that we kind of close that gap. We've slowly been trying to get to what we call one.NET, which is, you know, one set of compilers, one set of garbage collectors, one set of jitters, one set of APIs. I see. And uh, you'll continue to see us shrink and share stuff more and more across the, yep. the various runtimes. Today, the runtimes would be Mono, .NET Core, .NET Framework, um, and right. native. Gotcha. So, like, and and because open source has really kind of like changed that culture, so now we can actually kind of do this now, right? I mean, before it wasn't certainly, possible. Certainly really. easier. Certainly easier. But it takes um, AOT is is hard, so it'll take some time. It'll take some time. Cool. All right. By the way, uh, Skull Crusher for life. You are awesome. Uh, did he just build that demo while in the middle of the session? Nice. So that's shout out to Scott. Nice job, dude. Um, one more question here. Um, can I now use WPF and or WinForms from PowerShell Core and or on Linux or Mac? So I don't actually know how to answer the PowerShell Core question. <laughs> okay. um, the Linux or Mac is, uh, so basically, WinForms and WPF still rely on a mm -hmm. bunch of Windows APIs for input, output, for drawing. And so you know those are still you know Windows desktop only components. Um, so we have nothing more to share there as far as announcements. Okay. I'd like more. to add to that, though. I, people ask this question all the time. It's like, so I, we've, we've been talking about .NET Core 3 and desktop for a while. And it's like, hey, are you going to make WPF cross-platform? Are you going to make WinForms cross-platform? I don't really think you want a WinForms app looking like a WinForms app on a Mac right. or a Linux machine. So I, I, I think we haven't decided, or, or even the industry has not decided yet, what the best cross-platform UI story is. And so while it sounds great to say WinForms could run on a Mac, a Mac user would go, why do I have this weird X it in the window? Look right. yeah. I don't have the dots over on the left side. I, I, that doesn't feel like th th they match. Why, um, did, why did you make my, my Mac look like, uh, like Windows a, 95? Like a Windows, not, <laughs> Windows 95. It would be make, make a Mac look like Windows 95. So I don't think these are the right technologies for that. Um, I don't think Microsoft today has a story on what cross-platform UI is. That's something that Mike and I would love to work on in the future, uh, but we're not there yet. Um, yeah. And so I, but, but yeah, these are Windows tech. I think for the PowerShell one, that PowerShell core runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So, yeah, you could probably call some. I mean, there's there's probably you know a bunch of types. Like if you wanted to go use a system draw, dot drawing rec, you could you know like there's a bunch of types that are don't actually have you know UI backing. Yeah, I'm right. sure you could use inside, but um, you know if it's if it's going to you know basically if it's WinForms, if it's going to do anything HWIN related or you know do draw a something. P invoke, yeah. it's yeah. not going to work. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not, not going to work. work. Cool. Okay, makes sense. Um, okay, how close is .NET Core to, to build self-contained executables? Is it similar to Golang? That's a good question. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of a long roadmap discussion again. So what we'll do in the 3.0 timeframe is we will give you a, we'll, we'll have some, some technology we have that will basically take the assemblies that make up your application and compact them into a single exe. Okay. It still is all those individual components they're just, just packaged they're better, just packaged better okay. into a single exe for you. Okay. Uh, the go question is more of, are we going to provide native exes on those platforms? Um, and that comes back to the AOT story we talked about earlier for WebAssembly and for .NET Native. Right. Um, and what um, ahead of time compile AOT is something we are definitely looking at post the 3.0 wave. Okay. Great. Exciting. Um, all right. So one more question here. Are you going to enable enable application domains and DLL unloading? So app domains is a good one. Yeah. Um, that, is, that is something that, uh, obviously, as we've been working with partners to port uh, their WPF and WinForms apps, it's come up and it, you know, it's pretty rare that people actually need the, this kind of um, process level isolation like features, but there, there are some APIs on app domain that are useful. And so um, we're working to create an app domain uh, class that has a lot of kind of API functionality that, you know, more or less, but doesn't actually have the kind of uh, code isolation of, of an app domain, but it has, has some of the additional features that people, we found people using we'll use, okay. um, from that perspective. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of customers use app domains today to load extensions and like even Visual Studio, I'm sure you're using app domains when yep. you install some other extension to Visual Studio. It lets mm -hmm. them load some third-party DLLs into the application and you can unload them. 
um, we're going to build a new library on top of Core for doing that. Very cool. Uh, it won't be AppDomains. AppDomains actually combined a whole bunch of random stuff together, yeah. um, and some of it didn't work very well. And so we that. don't want to bring the stuff that didn't work very well forward into Core. But, but like, just to stitch those two things together, that we, you know, an app, we could make an app, app domain API shell, basically, or shim, that would, that would use the, you know, that would do the loading and unloading, but, but, you know, so it would be API compatible with your existing code, but then could call the, the new, you know, better functioning, actually, APIs under the covers. But we'll give you the same functionality that most people want to use it for, yeah. which is loading extensions. We'll, we're, we'll build a new, we're building a new API right now for that. Cool. Awesome. And, and as a general shout out to any API questions, um, the, the best thing to do is to use API port on your on your uh, code and you know either send us a report or share that uh, via a GitHub issue so we can we can keep track of these things because now that we have a public place to keep track it really helps us steer the roadmap. Yeah, we so had a blog post. About, I, I don't yeah. unfortunately I don't know it off the top of my head the URL, but we had a blog post I think in August uh, that Alia on the team put up and we actually had a tool you could actually run and just point it at your exe and it would basically look at the the APIs and all it, it this so you felt safe. It would show you the output of what it was going to send, and then you would press send. It sends us the yeah. APIs. That information helps us a lot to know what what APIs to port. Okay, so that we can take a look and say, hey, we know a lot of people yeah. used API yeah. X. We're going to support API. And it's anonymized too. It basically just says these APIs this many times, not necessarily what you use them for, or any variable names or anything like that. Gotcha. So it's, okay, that's it's awesome. That's awesome. Privacy scrub. Let me throw a question in, just the, yeah. myself off of this, just, <laughs> sure. just because it, 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 it's a common question. That people Would you ask. like to host the next session? No. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> another one that uh, comes up a lot is what is our story for WCF? Um, I thought before I wait sure. for it to show up on the screen, I thought we just we just talk about Let's it a talk about bit. WCF. Um, a lot of .NET Framework applications are using WCF or they're using .NET Remoting. We're not bringing either of these technologies to core at this point, uh, but we are looking at alternatives. Uh, there is gRPC, uh, which is an RPC model, which is very similar to a remoting or a WCF model. Okay. Um, and so the ASP.NET Core team is working with the gRPC project themselves um, to make that thing have first class .NET, .NET support and actually make it like, it like it feels very similar to like an ASP.NET or something else would. So we're looking at that. Okay. Um, and we're also potentially looking at are the parts of, ser parts of service model, which is the guts, the low-level bits of, of WCF, that we could bring forward um, without bringing all of WCF. So we're we're looking at, at at various angles of how do we solve the RPC problem because that is a, it's a valid concern and we need to have one on .NET. That's that's a good point. Um, do you guys want to talk a little bit about the .NET Foundation announcement today before we have well, a good. little bit of time well, here? Of anybody that should talk about the .NET Foundation <laughs> announcement, the so, chairman yeah. of the .NET Foundation should probably talk about this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, today. Was that a self, was that no, a self I, there? I just thought we were talking about .NET. Let's give let's talk a little bit about the .NET Foundation, and I think um, you know who better to talk about it than us because we're on .NET. So one of the announcements was about the uh, governance model changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so basically. Basically, um, expanding the board from three to seven people and six of them being able to run uh, anybody that has contributed anything to any .NET Foundation project can run or, or can vote. Uh, I think that's going to let the foundation really scale its efforts more, right? So how, why does this, like, really, why do I care as a developer? Well, you care about your platform. You care about the longevity of your platform and the, and the size and the health of your ecosystem, right? So that's kind of what the foundation is about in general, right? It's that center of gravity for open source around .NET. And if we have more people that have a stake in that and are volunteering to do something they're passionate about and help that move that forward, uh, we're only going to have more growth and more success with the platform. So that's how I took it. Um, and yes, I am the appointed member um, on the board from Microsoft. So I have huge passion in this area. So um, I, I think that's going to be like a fantastic new era for, for .NET. Well, I, I think another big point in the .NET Foundation is, if, historically, if you look at the last couple of years, the .NET Foundation feels more like the Microsoft .NET Foundation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what the governance model really is about is about making it equal for everybody. Um, there's only a, a single Microsoft rep representative that has to be in the foundation. Uh, the rest of it is community elected. Um, so it is not heavily t tilted towards uh, Microsoft. Uh, the foundation historically has also been funded by Microsoft. And it's going to go to a self-fund cycle as well. So it's going to become more of an independent foundation that's run by the community and not something that you, know, you could interpret the, old, the older version of the foundation as more of a Microsoft run thing. Right. And I think there's like even like uh, <laughs> rules in there like where only two max I think board members can be from the same company so you yeah, can stack. You yeah. can't stack or Yeah. Even, yeah. 
But so that makes it even more open, more fair, um, and get better. You, the idea is to get more ideas as well from other companies as well, and, and to be more open, to be more less Microsoft. I mean, we're yeah. you know we're we're riding this open source wave, and we want the the .NET and the .NET Foundation to be as open as possible. And I think there's just a lot of things that we can do, right? With we when we have that you know extra money, we have those extra bodies, we can scale more, we can have you know different types of Tackle events, more problems, we yeah. can help you know help our community do the things they really want to do too. So I think that's pretty cool. So I'm excited. I'm and excited. Hey, it's been saying on the front page of Hacker News all day as well. So uh, yeah, the community yeah, must be excited too. Yeah, that's actually pretty exciting. Yeah, I'm actually pretty excited about that. So. So are we worried about voter fraud for any of the positions? <laughs> we only use .NET for that, so you're fine. Okay. <laughs> so there is a question here. So there's a, there looks like they're having a discussion of what are the benefits of joining the board. So. That's actually a really good question. And, um, when Scott asked me, me, I was like, first of all, why me? Um, and then I was thinking about it really though, it's, it's, a, it's a volunteer position and you really are about directing the, the platform, directing the ecosystem. It's really about making choices that are going to benefit .NET. And when I say .NET, I mean the, the platform itself as well as the community around the platform. So that's that's kind of what you, why you would join the board. You have some passion around .NET open source um, and you want to help the community. And that's that's how I see it, joining the board. Um, I am excited. I, I have some ideas and, and I can't wait to see who else is going to be on that board. Um, so elections will start in January. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to run, we'll have all the information on the .NET Foundation.org website about that. So that's very cool. Cool. So, are cool. you going to run? Um, I, I guess we have one more slot for Microsoft. We have one right? more slide, slot for Microsoft. I'll have yeah. to see the competition. Kind of, you know, <laughs> I awesome. Cool. Um, so we got a couple more questions here. Let's uh, go ahead and say any plans for UI automation for Core or UWP? Um, so we do have. Uh, UI testing um, for for UWP and for Windows apps with one app driver. Um, I'm assuming you're actually talking about the UI automation class, though. I'm um, assuming that's I would what be, the question. I'm not sure. There's there's a bunch of different scenarios that UI automation. You know, it, it can be used for accessibility tools. It can be used for testing. It can be used for um, for actually doing some other scripting uh, of, of scenarios. So I think I I don't think there's any plans right now um, for any of the frameworks to have UI automation. Um, or at least in UWP, but it would be really interesting to know what the scenarios they're looking for because that's the thing that we, we probably have a good answer for based, you know. Cool. Well, is there anything else uh, you guys want to say to the .NET community out there on Twitch before we wrap it up? Big thing is download .NET Core 3, try the bits out, give us feedback. I mean, the, the reality is this is preview one. I said it was really early, really raw, um, but, you know, we have like 10,000 people that run that tool showing us what APIs they, they, they needed. What we need is more people to try it and give us feedback. Well, and, and definitely go download .NET Core 2.2, which is released today. So make sure you get yeah. on those new bits. So thank you so much, Mike. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, thanks Scott. Great. Thank All you, right. Beth. All right. Thank you.